Okay, good to have you. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. We really appreciate you making the effort uh, to be with us. Um, the meetings continue next uh, Friday night, God willing, at quarter to eight. And then Paul has some materials at the back there. Most of us are familiar with them. Uh, this was, I think, last week, uh, the fall of Jericho. And then there was one Paul has made just recently called uh, Curses, Cause and Cure. Uh, so that's CDs and uh, DVDs. So if you want any of those, and there's a small variety there, Paul. I feel very vulnerable without my pulpit tonight. I really do. Uh, do you know where pulpit started, of course, back in the book of Ezra? Ezra, in the days of Nehemiah, the Bible says that he built a pulpit of wood and he preached from it. And that's where they originate. And somebody has stolen our pulpit. So we'll have to try and find out where it is. But thankfully we have a Bible, and that's good, even we haven't got the pulpit. So we're going to turn together, please, to, in our Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Now this is a familiar passage of Scripture to everyone who's a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it might not be, but for all who are, it'll be very familiar. And we're going to break in at verse 6, uh, and we have a, a number of verses, but it's a very interesting a story of what happened in the early church and just some of the phenomenal things that happened as they pioneered and sought to reach into the community where God was guiding them to preach the gospel. So Acts chapter 16 and verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they said to go on to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul. In the night there stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over and help us. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, losing from Thrace, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is a chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in the city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. She attended unto those things which were spoken of Paul, and when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. It came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by Sue's saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this they did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that their hope of gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace onto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Now let's bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together around your word. And we thank you that your word is living. And we pray tonight, Lord, that you would come and draw near to us, that you would put a hedge around us, Lord, and that you would stand by your spirit in the midst. We pray, Lord, that you will speak. We pray that you will, Lord, uh, knock at the heart. And that you will, Lord, open our understanding. 
And we pray that you will change us, Lord, by your truth. I ask, Lord, as I give myself to you, that you would cleanse me and sanctify me and anoint me. So, Lord, just please send the Holy Spirit now in power. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be with us and to work in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to speak to you for a little while this evening on the triumph of the gospel. The triumph of the gospel. I think there's very few other passages in scripture that relay the power of the gospel in this missionary endeavor of Paul and Silas. In this we find this particular chapter there are three unique uh, powerful interventions by God into three lives. The first one is a person who's very religious and God breaks into their life. The next person is deeply involved in the occult and is possessed by evil spirits and God breaks into her life. And then we have a man who has come to the end of himself and he's just at the point of committing suicide and just as he's preparing for that act, Paul steps in and God changes his life. An amazing message that can transform those three persons who are representative of most of the community that we live in today. You see, what we have to remember as we consider the gospel is, first of all, it, it's never a fashionable thing in any country or in any generation. Never get it in your mind that the gospel, the true gospel, will become fashionable. Because there's something in the heart of every man that is in opposition to God and truth. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But despite the fact that it's never fashionable, we also have to remember as Christians, there is no incurable cases. When it comes to the gospel, the Lord can reach anybody. The Lord can save anybody. And that's very clearly marked out in this chapter. Now, in preparation of this message, during the week, last Saturday, some of us were down in Newcastle. And a young man gave a reading from the scripture. And when he read it, it lodged in me. And I thought a lot about it. And I thought I was going to prepare a message on something else. But those of you who are preachers will know that when the Holy Spirit plants something in you, it's really hard. To, to move to something else. And what makes it more difficult, I'm really unveiling the secrets of preachers here tonight. What's really difficult is when the Lord gives you a passage that you have to preach on, and then he doesn't tell you what the message is. You can't get it. You can't understand what he wants to say to you. That's very frustrating. And time goes by. And then do you know what some preachers will do? They'll try to jump to another place in the Bible. Or they'll maybe consider an old message that they preached years ago. And I have to say that I was tempted in all those directions. But the Holy Spirit kept me focused on this particular passage. And he just wouldn't let me away from it. So I really struggled. But I really believe tonight that God has something to say to us as a group. I believe this is not just in relation to individual needs. But the needs as a group as to what God has for us and what God has uh, desired and designed for us. I feel that that's all entwined in this. And so we find Paul and Silas who are both Christians, apostles, preachers, and God has called them to the ministry. And in verse 6 we find that these two men are on their journeys for the Lord. They're traveling from village to village, city to city, to preach the gospel. To tell men and women that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And this gospel has been so successful in the past. And they carry it in their heart. And they're, they're on their way, as I say, to different villages and locations. But something unusual happens. 
And, and it's very important that as Christians we understand this. You see, Paul and Silas went to various locations to preach. And every time they went to some particular place, the Holy Spirit would tell them, you're not in the right place. Now we find that hard today to comprehend. It's most natural to think that if two evangelists go to a town and they preach the gospel, that automatically they're doing the right thing. But the Bible teaches that that isn't always the case. Now we thank God for the gospel being preached in different places, but what I want you to see is this sensitivity to the will of God. God has a plan here, and initially the apostles aren't just getting it dead right. They're carrying the right message, they're moving and they're trusting God, but they haven't got everything right. And so the Lord speaks to them. And we read it here in, in chapter 16 and verse uh, 6 when they're going through Phrygia in Galatia. And the, and the Bible says they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit. Then they travel on a little later. And it says they go to Mysia. And they want to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. And so there's this, there's this frustrating of what they want to do. And all they want to do is preach. All they want to do is tell people about the Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit keeps saying no, no. And come to a point where the Lord has said no to them and, and then they're waiting on God. And what I want you to see about these early Christians, these preachers, is that first of all they were moving. They, they, they were moving and seeking to win the lost for the Lord. Secondly, they were praying. They were seeking the Lord about what his will was, but even more importantly, they were listening. They were listening to what God had to say to them. And that's very clear because God spoke to them uh, through this, this vision that came, and Paul saw a man from Europe, from Greece, and he said, come over and help us. And immediately they knew that God wanted them to get on a boat and to go over to this region in Europe. Now in the Bible it says here that the Holy Spirit forbade them. It says that the Holy Spirit restrained them. Now here's the thing I want you and I to consider is how did that actually work? And does it happen today? How can you be forbidden of the Holy Ghost to do something? Did you ever have an experience where the Holy Ghost forbade you? Where the Holy Spirit told you, don't do that. That's what happened here. And what that shows me is that these early Christians were very sensitive to the person of the Holy Spirit. They were cued in or tuned in that God would speak. And God speaks not only to unconverted people and tells, tells them about their sin, that they need to be saved, but God speaks to Christians, telling them what they should and shouldn't do and where they should and shouldn't go. And so there's this real sensitivity. It's, it's a powerful and a gentle voice of God just saying, no. No, you're going the wrong. This is, this is not what I want. Now, there's no problem. These men are not in sin. These men are not in rebellion against God. It's just they're not, they're not just quite getting what God wants for them. But they're on the way. They're on the journey. God's, you know, he's guiding them. And they're sensitive. I remember on a few occasions where it really stands out where God kind of spoke to me in that fashion. I could give you many illustrations, but two stand out. And one was many years ago when I decided to buy a new car. I've never bought a new car, but I decided to buy a new car. Now, we had the resources to do it. We could have got a little loan to, you know, make it up. So, and I really felt quite excited about buying a new car. And we needed it because the family had got bigger. We needed more room for in the car that we had. And so there was everything. Nobody could have said, no, well, you, you don't need it or you shouldn't do it. But I really found all about the car. And so um, I, I arranged to go and see it. This man had brought the car from Dublin 
or somewhere brought it up. So I, we drove. And just before we left the house, we were in the car and we prayed. We said, Lord, if this is not the right thing, please don't let us get it. But inwardly, I was hoping, well, Lord, I'm praying this, but, you know, I, I kind of my mind made up. It's a new car and this old thing I have done. And I arrived and there was this beautiful new vehicle sitting I got into it and Rachel got in and the children and we drove down the road and all I can say to you is as we drove down the road something in me died. That's all the way I can describe it, it died. And I couldn't wait to get that car turned and get it back to the garage and get out of it. And I was so pleased to say farewell to that man and get back into my car. Now, the only thing I can say regarding that was it wasn't remotely natural. It wasn't natural for that to happen, not with me. But I really believe God stepped in and said, no, I don't want you to do that. He had another car for me, but he did that. Another occasion, a little, little different, was, I've told this before, going to, uh, uh, to, to Lisbon, I was preparing for a meeting, and this lady rang me and said, I want to get saved. Now, I can assure you that doesn't happen very much. But this woman rang, I said, I'll be over straight away. Arrived at the home, this woman comes out and she says, come into my home. I have these unusual things, paranormal things happening in the house. Come in. And I walked in and as I went to the door, you've maybe heard me this before, but when I turned to walk into her living room, I never felt as near hell in my life. That's the honest truth. And I ran out of that house. I ran out and I stopped at the door. And she turned around, obviously wondering where I was. She was in her living room at the stage, so I disappeared. And when she came out, she says, what? I said, there's something really evil goes on in your house. And I said, I, I can't go into it. And that was another occasion. Now, other people came subsequent to that, and they prayed in that home, and a lot of things were, were, were happening, and God ministered to those people. But the Lord was saying to me at that point by the Holy Spirit, Alan, you can't, you can't deal with this. This is too big for you. So you have to get out of this. And the Holy Spirit said to me, in my spirit, get out. So the Holy Spirit can forbid us. The Holy Spirit can restrain us from doing things that we otherwise might like to do. Now, of course, how is it that, that Paul and Silas, where did this ability come from? This ability to read a situation and decide no, and to be able to say categorically, I shouldn't do that. What, what is actually happening in the individual when that happens? Well, it's, it's obviously a spiritual thing. It's down deep inside the personality of the individual. And we find it mentioned, if you turn with me in your Bible to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit enters their spirit. And the Holy Spirit then tells us within that we belong to the Lord. And of course that gives us this assurance and then we're able to tell people that we're Christians, that we love the Lord and we know we're going to heaven because the Holy Spirit has entered into us when we repent and receive Jesus Christ. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, Paul speaks here more specifically about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to Christians. And, and in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, this is what he said regarding these gifts. He said, to another, uh, the, a person is given the gift of the working of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, discerning of spirits. This is a gift given by the Holy Spirit. It's called the discerning of spirits. Now, every Christian will have some degree of discernment, but there is a gift of discernment that is specifically given by the Holy Spirit for the good of the church. Now, this gift of discernment is quite unique. It's a discerning of spirits. Now, spirits are essentially bodies without, or rather, personalities without a body. A spirit is a person without a physical body. 
So here's the discerning of the spirits mentioned, and it's very, very, very important in the Christian church. Because the Bible makes it very clear that we live in a spiritual realm where there are entities and powers that are operating all around us all the time. And we read from this passage, it's possible that they can be in us as well and literally controlling our lives also. And so the Bible teaches that there are four principal types of spirits uh, in the Bible. The first one we have mentioned, which, which Paul and Silas uh, uh, understood, was the Holy Spirit. A discerning of the Holy Spirit. And I hope as a Christian that whenever, as you mature, that you go into settings, you go into environments where you sense the Holy Spirit. Where you know that the Lord is present or you know that he is absent. That that's, that's the discerning of spirits, the Holy Spirit. Then, of course, there's demonic spirits. So there's, there's an understanding or a comprehension of something evil. That's, that's, again, a discernment from God that you can sense something that is not of God. I remember on one occasion uh, going into a, a, a prayer session with a lady, and she was a Christian. But this lady had come for prayer over a different issue. And this is very abnormal in my experience but I felt really something odious and obnoxious from this woman. And she was a lovely Christian. She was very kind. And she came in and sat down. But I felt something so odious about that woman. There was something about her that just grated on everything inside me. And there was another gentleman there to pray. And I had been feeling and sensing something in my mind, but I didn't like to say it. But it was there. Now, this doesn't happen very often to me, but it happened on this occasion. And so they began to pray with this lady. And it went on and on. And we weren't really making a lot of progress. And eventually, this, this thing that kind of emanated from this lovely Christian lady that really grated on me, I said, you're full of pride. You're full of pride. And what a reaction came and that pride wasn't primarily in her it was it was an ancestral thing her whole ancestry all her family were all very proud people and she was impacted by that and once that was mentioned in prayer the reaction was unbelievable that came up that was a demonic influence that was having some element of control in that woman's life, even though she didn't want to be proud, but that was there. And so there can be a discernment of the demonic. Then there's the angelic. Angelic, the Bible says angels are ministering spirits. So you have, for example, Daniel in chapter 8, that when Daniel met Gabriel, when he encountered him, he knew who he was. He, he was able to communicate. It did absolutely, literally knock him out when Gabriel appeared. He literally went on his face. He lost all his strength. Such was the, the, the revelation and such was the impact on his natural body that he just passed out when this great angelic being appeared. And then, of course, there is the human spirit. The discerning of human spirits. That is people. You meet people. And you can meet, you can meet people and you can read them. <coughs> they can be very pleasant, but you can read them. And that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. You're able to read the person behind the facade. And there's many Christians like that. They have a facade. There's a, there's a back door. It's not the real person you're, you're talking to. There's something behind that. And that's the bit that the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, can reveal and unveil. Do you remember the Lord Jesus, when he talked about Herod, he said, that fox, Herod? What was he saying? Jesus said he's sly. He's a deceiver. I know what he's really like. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus called Nathaniel? He said, he said a man in whose spirit there is no guile. Reading the human spirit. 
I'm sure you've maybe come across that whenever you have people and uh, they talk to you and they're very pleasant to you, but you know in your heart that everything you stand for, that they're totally against it. I've found that many times. And I'm very grateful to God for it because it preserves me from getting hurt. Otherwise, you could just start to spill out stuff that you're doing or involved in. And those people would use that against you. But you learn to be quiet because you know that that person will do you harm. You know that they will say things behind your back. And what you're dealing with is not the real person. And so there is this discerning of spirits. And Paul had this amazing gift. Amazing gift. And so he's, he's moving on uh, as the Holy Spirit has guided him. And they come to this place eventually where they're guided to called Philippi. Now Philippi, of course, is important. It's important not because Philippi itself is of any great importance, but it's because the Holy Spirit... It's important to him. Now the other places are important as well, but Philippi is important to the Holy Spirit. That's why these men who have been praying and seeking and waiting on God up to now have not quite got it, but there is a location. There is a spot, there is a place that God has said, this is it. This is it. It's Philippi. And so the Lord strategically brings them to this important place. And of course, we do know from a practical point of view that Philippi is going to be the base or the springboard to Europe. That's why it's important. This is the beginning of the gospel breaking into a continent. This is a little thing that's going to lead to a huge thing. This is something that's small that's going to spill out big. But Philippi is important. They have to be at the right place. And so God wonderfully leads them to this place. It becomes, for the spreading of the gospel, it's essentially like D-Day when they arrive here. It's the beginnings of landing on the beaches and, and just digging in and it becomes a bridgehead for the future. And of course, when they come, we find in verse 12 and 13 that it says, And when they came to Philippi, it was a chief city of a, a part of Macedonia and a, a colony of Rome, that they were there abiding certain days. Now when they arrived at Philippi, they didn't run out with gospel tracts or go out and do open airs or do anything like that. They were abiding certain days. So they were. And as they were abiding there certain days, the Bible says in verse 12, from thence, uh, this chief city, verse 13, on the Sabbath we went out uh, of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake to the women which resorted thither. They went to the place of prayer, and you will notice throughout this entire chapter that it's, it's just, just constantly a uh, little full stops and then prayer and then a little full stop and then prayer then a little full stop and prayer these men are moving and they're praying and they're listening now those are very important qualities if you're going to have a bridgehead that's going to have a breakthrough you need to be uh, guided by god you need to be in prayer and you need to be listening and tuned in to the holy spirit that's where they are now as they're persevering. And they have got to the right spot where God wants them to be. And so in prayer, they are waiting on God a few days. I no doubt they were praying. And of course, they, they want to witness. That's what they're going to do now. How do we know that? Well, if you look back at verse 10, you will notice that after they had seen the vision of the man of Macedonia, they assuredly gathered that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. They knew what their calling was now when they were in Philippi. We have to preach the gospel. We have to tell men and women about their sin. We have to present Jesus Christ as the only Savior. That's, that's our calling now, as we're in the right spot. And so they go to a prayer meeting. 
Now, I was always told as a young Christian and right throughout my years that if you want to preach the gospel and you want to go into a community, you aim for the worst person first. I'm sure all of us have heard that. You aim for the worst person in the community. Well, Paul didn't do that. Not interesting. He didn't do that. Paul went to the person most of us would be told to pass by, religious people. Paul goes to the religious people. Paul goes to a woman who is a worshipper of God. She's religious. Now, she's not a Christian, but she's at a prayer meeting where that's where they used to meet. They would gather uh, at the riverside. They had no places of worship, but she was praying to, to God and she was seeking him. And of course, on top of that, she's a woman. She's religious and she's a businesswoman. So she's pretty highfalutin. Just the type of person you would imagine today, somebody, if you meet a lady and she has succeeded in business and there's a wee bit of religion about her, you would say, oh, let's pass this by. This woman's going to be contentious. She knows everything. She's, she has succeeded. Why would she want God? I mean, there's every reason why you would say, well, let's forget about this woman. Paul moves in, he just explains the gospel. He sits just talking to them and he talks about what Jesus has done, undoubtedly his testimony, and shares. And immediately the Bible says the Lord opens her heart. And that's what happens when someone sees it. The Lord opens their heart. You don't and I don't. It's the Lord that opens their heart. She attended to what he had told them. She became a Christian. She repented of her sin, put her faith and confidence in the Lord, and she immediately became a Christian. And from then, what a radical change. She immediately asked these preachers, come to my home, uh, come and stay with me. She's baptized. Her family become Christians. And this is the beginning of a little church that's going to start in Philippi, the first church in Europe. Wonderful thing. So they're staying in her home. Wonderful. God has done something great. But it's not over. That's the first step in Philippi. And so they move on. And, and what do they do? Well, we read that in verse 16, after this amazing conversion, it says, It came to pass as we went to prayer. They're heading out for prayer again together. Prayer is part and parcel of the ongoing life of the soul winner or the church planter, or the missionary. Prayer has to be the heart, the kernel, the beginning and the ending of the ministry. And so they pray. And as they're praying, they hit a very strategic obstacle. Now this is very important for any individual Christian, but also for us as a corporate group. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, and we can see that so clearly, that he had put them in this strategic place. But they, and the enemy had a strategic obstacle. There's no way Satan's going to let a breakthrough come and then sit back and let it continue. That will never happen. That's one of the reasons why historically in our churches, in going back, sadly we have to go back quite a distance, but very often churches in the past that really saw amazing blessing and conversions, what, was, what, the, what drove the church was there were very often what we called nights of prayer. And those churches that were really breaking through, when they got conversions, when something happened, that didn't, they didn't settle on their lees. The men and women who were really knowing God, those people prayed night and day. They had nights of prayer in their churches, and, and they really kept the battle going. They really kept it going. And God broke through for them. And so they hit a strategic obstacle. It's not a religious person. God again set somebody that today, and we would pass them by, but today in the church, who would pass the second one by? Well, I would say 99% of Christians would take to their heels and they would say, whoa, there's a Satanist, there's a witch, and 
I was hearing recently about a, a, a very evangelical church, and, and it is, and gods are doing things. And, and this peculiar man that I happen to know of, he decided to start going to their prayer meetings. And so a few of them were, were, you know, they were into Christian politics, and they began gossiping, saying this guy was a witch. The prayer meeting dropped, they were gone. Christians, all the prayer meeting, just they couldn't get the Christians to the prayer meeting. We're all afraid of them. That's the most natural. You see, we're, we're, we're naturally taught to be afraid of anything supernatural that's not of God. And so you run from it. That's, that's the way we do it. We run from it. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that we have to be very careful in our addressing of spiritual obstacles in our, in our way. And I learned a lesson many years ago from Brother Pat Kitchen. Pat used to say to me, Alan, don't act, react. Don't run at the enemy. Don't become fascinated with the enemy. But if he gets in your way, if he comes into your arena, if he steps in where God wants you to go and he's holding you back, you have the right to move him out of the way. You need to address him. And so what was happening here was the enemy was showing up. And as the enemy showed up, the, the Bible gives us four specific points regarding this individual, this second person. And we read of it, first of all, that she was a slave girl. She was a slave girl. That means somebody owned her. It means that she was owned by another person. And that means, of course, she was totally under control. God's never in that game. God never controls people. Never. Not only was she controlled by people, but also the Bible said she was under the control of a demon spirit. That means she was also captive to Satan. That means she was con to totally controlled. Totally controlled. The Bible tells us that she was a fortune teller. That was her job, her fortune teller. Now, let me explain a few things to you. This woman was under the control of a spirit, an evil spirit that had come into her body and it gave her amazing abilities. This spirit gave her the ability to tell people's future to point out to them things that they would, would happen or wouldn't happen, and really to direct them regarding areas that they had no knowledge of. She, she helped them regarding their curiosity. Whenever a person goes to fortune tellers, they don't just walk into that little room with that strange person and walk out again the same. Because everybody that went in to get their fortune read would come out with a spirit attached to them. So the woman who's enslaved by the devil and men is enslaving others. That's her job. She's enslaving others. It's most probable that most of Philippi would be under control through fortune telling and other activities that were going on that, that certainly this wasn't a Christian community that Paul was stepping into. And so that was going on. And of course, uh, these people, uh, through this, this divination, there was control of finance. There was an amazing volume of money being transacted through this woman. We know that because whenever she lost the demonic power, then her, her employers went mad because they saw that their, their fortunes were finished now. It was big business. You see, friends, what happens is whenever people are under control and you don't have to be like this woman, the, the, the uh, possessed woman, to be under control. Control can come in many fashions through many various types of people. It starts with manipulation, where people manipulate you. <coughs> they can manipulate you through so many ways. People through their pain can manipulate you. People through their voice. 
And the way they use it can manipulate you. They can bribe you. <laughs> and so manipulation is one form of control. But then that leads to intimidation. Where you're intimidated, that's control. People, somebody controlling you. And of course the ultimate and the ultimate objective of intimidation and manipulation is domination. That is to have total control. So you're totally under control from a person or persons or whatever. Or, or else maybe, sadly, you, you could be the one that, that does it. <laughs> Controlling someone. The Holy Spirit is never involved in control or manipulation. People have control on others and they don't even realize that they're moving outside the will of the Holy Spirit. He never controls or manipulates. There are many types today of people who, who use this gift, this whatever people like to call it, this divination it's called in the Bible. Divination is essentially... Uh, Feeding into people's curiosity. Uh, people want to know, what should I do there? I don't know what to do. What decision should I make in business? I don't know what to do. I, I, I need the solution to this problem. Some people want to know the sex of their child. Is it a boy or a girl? And so they use the pendulum. That's divination. Some people require water and they want to find out where there's a water supply. And so they use a dousing rod and they go with a dousing rod and that will lead them directly to the water. That's divination. That's occultic, that's demonic. It's not of God. There's Christians who have it, and Christians who utilize it, but it's not of God. And so it, it can be in the form of using, people using tea leaves, divining rods, tarot cards, Ouija board, astrology, horoscopes, so on and so forth. There's so many areas. But that's what he was utilizing, this, this power. Now it's interesting when we read of this particular spirit that controlled her, this fortune-telling spirit, in the original uh, Greek language which the New Testament is written in, it's, it's called Python. And that was, it was a demonic spirit that controlled this girl and then controlled others. Now Python, it was a snake, a serpent spirit that lapped around and its purpose and objective was to squeeze. That's the Python. The Python squeezes life out. It suffocates. It, it, it restricts the lungs on, on, the, on the catch that it has. It goes around. It doesn't kill them by biting them or anything. It retains them by biting. It puts its teeth in and holds. And then it laps around. And then as the person or the animal or whatever breathes, then it restricts the lungs. And then they try to, every time they breathe in, it squeezes. And then there's no ability. And then eventually, when they're dead and they let the body rot, then they'll eat it. That's the python. That's the spirit that had control over this girl. Now I want you to notice what was happening. It's very interesting. This is the second convert. And by the way, we're not going to look at the third one in case you're worried about time. We're only going to touch the two. But what happened was whenever this woman uh, who had all these qualifications and was very influential in this city where the gospel was coming in and a lady and her family had been saved and Paul as I said had all these qualifications of sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, guidance from God, prayer, preaching the gospel. Paul has all these things ready at hand. He's just like a soldier coming in with all the different forms of equipment necessary to have breakthrough and he's moving. But this is a new one. This is different. What happens is as he is on his way to a time of prayer, undoubtedly in relation to preaching the gospel and wanting God's will and purpose, suddenly there is this proclamation that is sounded out over that region of Philippi. And in verse 17 we read this. The same, talking about this girl in verse 17, the same followed Paul and Silas and cried saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Now that's amazing. This woman wasn't whispering or running over to say, you boys are from God and you tell us how to be saved. This woman is shouting at the top of her voice. These are the servants of the most high God that show unto us the way of salvation. That doesn't make sense. A woman who is full of evil spirits, 
declaring to everybody in the region that's within her, her voice and telling them that these are Christians. These are the servants of the God of heaven and they're telling us how to be right with God. That doesn't add up. Doesn't add up. So what's going on? What, what's, what's the reason for this? You could have anticipated if she'd have turned around and said, these, these men are here to destroy us, get rid of them. But no. This spirit that is speaking through her tells the truth. I have heard people saying that evil spirits never tell the truth. They do tell the truth when it suits them. They tell lies when it suits them. If somebody told a lie all the time, you would know that they were a compulsive liar and that would be it. But spirits are, are, are they don't give all their character all the time. They tell the truth when it suits. And so we have to ask the question, why? Why did these spirits through this woman cry out what they cried? in a community that had never heard the gospel. Why draw attention to the preachers? Why do that? One of the reasons I suggest was to demonstrate its power. Before ever these men would begin to preach, the people already know, ah, the woman told us that you had come. The woman told us your message. I suggest to you that that was part of it, to demonstrate their power. Secondly, I suggest, it was to confuse the people. Because the people would find this hard to know, can we have the woman, what she's saying, she's telling us, this is the way of salvation, so she's introducing that, and she's telling the truth, so, so maybe, maybe everything she says is true. Maybe the fact that she told us this is the way of salvation, we can embrace that and, and embrace everything she says and, and bring in the enemy as well. The third I suggest to you is, is very a real possibility, and that is... In today's setting in Ulster, if someone was like this in a, vi in a village or a region where the gospel wasn't preached, and a person stood and said, these are evangelists and they're telling us how to become Christians. They're explaining the way of salvation. The average Christian would go over and say, would you like to be a deaconess in our church? Would you like to join us? God has given you amazing insight. You have such a gift. You should be in the center of the church. You should lead the praise. People can come and visit you and you can tell them because God has given you. My friends, that is exactly the type of thing would happen today in our churches. Because anything supernatural is regarded as God. Anything that where a person mentions the Bible or God or any truths, the average con uh, consensus of Christians is, it must be a Christian. I mean, they mentioned the Bible. I mean, they talked about the Lord and they talked about salvation. I mean, they're obviously Christians. The devil can become an angel of light. <laughs> I don't know what is the answer to this, but th those are three points I'm throwing out. You can take it home and chew over it yourself. But I suggest to you that, that those things are very real risks. But what I want you to notice about Paul as we draw to the close, this woman's proclamation led to provocation in Paul's heart. Do you remember we mentioned this discerning of spirits? That Paul discerned the Holy Spirit saying, don't go there. Do you remember we mentioned that, that it's possible also when a demonic spirit can rise in a person that, that it can be sensed, it's a discerning of spirits. Well, you see, Paul had that gift. Paul not only discerned the Holy Spirit, Paul discerned evil spirits. 
And Paul knew he didn't have an issue with the woman. Paul felt sorry for her. Paul undoubtedly had probably prayed for her in his times of prayer. Because after all this went on day after day, he didn't rebuke her the first day. It went on day after day. She came out and done this every day. But Paul's getting provoked. What's happening? Paul's spirit inside him is being agitated. He's been agitated. And he's been agitated because the Holy Spirit is revealing to Paul inside, this is the devil. This is the arch enemy. This is the great deceiver. And you see, friends, what I know about Paul through reading this passage is that Paul not only was a great evangelist, Paul not only had amazing sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, Paul not only moved and went where God wanted him to go, but Paul had an amazing insight into what we call today spiritual warfare. It's what basically means he knew how to handle different situations as they presented themselves. Paul didn't say to Silas, listen, there's a woman and she's given off and the devil, let's run and have a wee prayer meeting. He didn't turn around and say, listen, Silas, I'm terrified, let's get out of here. Now there's times when you have to do that if you're not mature enough. That happened to me. But Paul's mature. Paul's God's man for this moment, for setting up something that, that is going to have great ramifications to the entire European continent. This is big. This is big. And so she provokes him. And provokes him. And then the day comes, the moment comes, when the Holy Spirit moves upon Paul. And he comes upon him in unusual power. And the Bible tells us what Paul does. Verse 18, and this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, not to the woman. He wasn't talking to the woman. He's talking to the spirit in the woman. He turns and says to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. You see, my dear friends, when Paul pronounced this, he knew there was power in Jesus' name. He knew about warfare. He knew when he landed in this uh, region called Philippi that there was going to be warfare. But listen, thank God he had all the equipment he needed. So many today go out to the mission field. So many are doing missionary tours and they haven't a clue. They haven't a clue. And so they go out and their collateral damage in no time because the enemy is sitting positioned but there's no understanding or comprehension of spiritual warfare. Many years ago, I remember going to a prayer meeting and there was a gentleman who used to come every Sunday morning at 7 o'clock to the prayer meeting. And he used to always pray, Lord, give us command of the skies. Give us command of the skies. And he would always relate in prayer how that during the war, once that the Americans and the British got a hold of the sky over Germany and Europe, then the war was over. Whoever had the sky had the victory. And Paul understood that. I mean, we say today, well, I don't really see that in the Bible. I don't understand what you're talking about, warfare. Paul made it so clear. He said, listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Paul said, that's what we're dealing with. And that's why Philippi was such a success, because the man who was used with, his, with other servants of God to go in to this arena, when they met the devil at every front through personalities, they succeeded. They knew what to do. They had the weaponry. They were confident in the Lord. They were confident in his victory. And as they utilized the tools, they discovered that it was working. It was working. And listen, it still works. It worked then, and it still works. That was the method then. That is the method now. Anything short of that is not the complete method. 
And so he pronounces it. Now what happens in closing? He pronounces it. Now wouldn't you think, listen, wouldn't you think, take it into today's society. So somebody is involved a bit in the occult. Okay? Two Christians go along and they happen to be not afraid of this thing. They pray and they take authority over it. And the thing goes and the whole thing falls apart. I mean, you would expect a bit of a rumble and a lot of people give off. You wouldn't expect the whole city to go into a pro. This is nuts, isn't it? The whole city goes into uproar. I mean, there's, there's something touched here. There's, there's a raw nerve. There's, there's something deep has been, has been hit. And, and, and the consequences on the earth are phenomenal. You see, friend, you see, th this woman was a key woman in Satan's strategy to hold on to this region. There was so much the enemy had done for so long to hold this entire community ransom and under his control. But there was something about Paul coming in and he addressed this woman and a blow was dealt to this demonic entity called Python. And as a result of that, there was some kind of catastrophic falling apart of what Satan had built. I can't fully understand it, but it's very clear as you read between the lines that something catastrophic had happened in the spirit realm which led to absolute chaos and conflict arising in the earth. You've heard it said that whenever you preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll either have a riot or a revival. Well, that's all interlinked with this. That's true. These two men are taken, they're beaten, they're stripped, they're thrown into prison. Why? Because Satan knows that something big and strategic that he had is lost. Something of the power of the gospel in the heavens was introduced. Something of God's amazing ability through what Jesus done on the cross has been implemented into the heavens and where Satan held sway is now a no-go area for him. And so the only thing he can do is, is rearrange the battle. <laughs> He can't arrange the battle anymore in the heavens because he has lost that. So what he does is he takes his brats that are on the earth and he uses his brats to try and get his job done. That's what the devil does. But it fails. It fails. <laughs> that doesn't all happen overnight. But it's the beginnings of what happened in Europe. I don't know how much Satan could see of the future. But you all know, I trust historically, that Europe was the center of the preaching of the gospel for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We are recipients tonight of what happened there. That's why we're here. I want to close with one thing. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will say to us, don't go there. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will convey to us a restriction. Don't, don't, or don't face that or don't introduce that, whatever. But where discernment is greatly needed in this arena is this. There are times when the Holy Spirit will say to you, don't do that. And there's times when Satan will say to you, don't do that. And you'll need to have the discernment to know whether it's the Holy Ghost or whether it's Satan. You see, friends, Paul says when writing to the church of Thessalonica, this is what he said. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, he said, I wanted to go and visit you, but Satan hindered me. That's what he said. Satan hindered me. And it's interesting when you look up the word hindered, in the original Greek language what it means. Let me read them out. It means to block off a road. So you're on a road and a block comes up. That's Satan hindering, stopping you on the road. It means to cut off 
what is desired, what you desire, and he cuts it off. Satan hindering. It means to impede, impede you, stop you, hold you back, to detain you, to keep you held in. <laughs> if you're detained, if you're going through the airport and they decide, oh, we don't like you, and they bring you in, they detain you. Satan can detain you. He can put you aside and hold you. And then one that's very interesting in the translation of this word, it means to be tedious to, to annoy you, to really annoy you, to really vex you in life, the hinderer. The Bible says to you and I as Christians, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may desire, devour. Whom resist, whom resist in the faith. You see, we are called to be overcomers. We are called to be triumphant in battle. Now, one of the tragedies for today in our land is this, and in our churches, is that there's, there are aspects of what I have preached on tonight that the church could totally endorse and say, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But there's a considerable amount of what I have preached on tonight, and many, many Christians, if you ask them experimentally, do you know what I'm talking about? They'd say, I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue what you're talking about. It's one of the reasons why we're in the place we're in. But God desires that we be equipped, that we find our place. And from that place where God puts us, the ramifications and the outcome only God can tell. Only God can tell. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless your truth to our hearts. And that you would enable us, Lord, that we would be those who know uh, the Holy Spirit so working in our lives that we would be able to discern, that we would be able to tell. And Lord, that these enablings that were given to Paul, that we in the church today would, would know these enablings. And Lord, that you would make us strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In Jesus' name, amen.